This is less of a creepy one-person encounter, and more of a whole community creeped out by one man. The neighbor in question is somewhat famous for his lawn, an impossibly thick green landscape that he had tended by a company. I'm vaguely aware of him losing it on the landscapers, screaming at them outside. Enough I knew he had a temper. The first real red flag that he might be legit crazy came last summer. He asked a teenage boy in the neighborhood to check in on the house once a day and make sure all the doors and windows were secured and water their flowers. The day they left though, he left a crazy list saying the kid had to be there multiple times a day, turning off and on different sets of lights at specific times and leaving weird chores for him. Also, the kid was not allowed to walk on the lawn and he had to remove his dirty shoes before walking on the concrete sidewalk. He was never to enter the house, but was to turn off and on the lights from the doorway by means of a stick with a loop on it. Also, he was not allowed to use the garden hose to water the lawn and had to instead use a teeny tiny watering can. The letter implied that my neighbor would have the kid under surveillance and would have pictures if he failed to comply. Basically, the kid's parents called him and said they weren't comfortable with the situation anymore and while they would keep an eye on the house, the deal was off. They argued over the phone. When my neighbor got back from vacation, it was early morning, and he immediately went to their house, woke them, and tried to pick a fight with them. One of the other neighbors is a retired colonel and came out to see what was going on and tried to settle the issue. Crazy neighbors said that he would let it rest if he was allowed to bare ass spank the kid. He flipped out when they told him hell no. Sometime after this, Another neighbor was at the grocery store when he was concerned by Crazy Neighbor. Crazy Neighbor apparently just talked at him in rapid fire for a half hour. Among other things, he started saying how wives shouldn't have friends and said that his wife's sister was so fat she broke the toilet seat last time she visited. After this, everyone started talking about how you don't see his wife anywhere. Occasionally she will be out watering flowers, but while her husband is seen out, she isn't. Considering that she used to be a social butterfly, this is weird. During the winter, everyone found pamphlets on their mailbox from the landscaper he uses, along with a note saying it was mandatory to now use this landscaper in our area and failure to comply will result in being sued. We are private single-family homes with no homeowners association, so this is patently untrue. During the winter, someone saw his wife and her arm was in a sling and she had a black eye. When they went to ask her about it, he wouldn't let her speak and said she had slid on ice. Since then, there have been a few attempts made to talk to her alone, and all have failed. They've gone so far as to get their church involved and to call a welfare check by the cops when he was out of the house. But if she is being abused, she has been refusing help. Snow was bad this year, and he blew a fit about the snowplows piling snow on his property. So he scattered screws on the roadway outside before they came one morning. Then someone in the neighborhood got a puppy. It's quiet and has a fenced-in backyard. Its owners wake up in the middle of the night to the doorbell ringing. When they come out, Crazy Neighbor is standing on the road at the edge of the property. He tells them that the first time the dog gets out, they won't have a dog anymore, and he pulls out a gun and waves it around, before pointing it towards the backyard and saying, Bang. Obviously, they go back inside and call the cops. When confronted, Crazy Neighbor claims he was out for a walk, thought they were awake and stopped by. He says he didn't get the gun out, but it had been on his belt and that he didn't mean his statement as a threat. He ended up getting some sort of citation from the police. 
Come spring, he has taken to sitting outside and writing something every time someone walks or drives by. We don't know what, but I have taken to driving differently home to avoid going by him. Most recently, someone put up a swing set in their backyard. They came back from work to find tire tracks through the backyard and the swing set run over and crushed. No one saw anything, but his massive truck happens to have the same kind of tires as the tread arcs left behind. The retired colonel has taken to compiling statements from everyone and keeping records, because we think this is going to end badly. I recently moved into a new apartment. It's a fairly old building, but the rent is cheap, and it's got its own gym, so me and my roommates were easily sold on the place. We live in the corner apartment, so we only have two neighbors. One is a fairly old man, his partner, and their dog. They're pretty nice. The other neighbor, I only met a week ago. I originally heard about her from her boyfriend. One morning, on Monday, as I head out to the elevator to go to work, I'm asked to hold it by a guy running down the hall. I let him on, and we start the ride down. He asks if I'm new, and if I like the place so far. I say yes, and give small answers. Still half asleep, clutching my coffee thermos. The guy laughs and says, You look just like my girlfriend, Amy. She's barely coherent until she gets her first cup of coffee. I laugh weakly, my still sleepy brain a little annoyed. Yeah, I'm not a morning person. It's clear that this guy's head over heels for Amy, and is a morning person. The two minute trek to the street outside our apartment is his excitable gabber about Amy. And apparently, he's planning something big for this weekend. He wants to do something nice for her birthday. We part ways at the street, and I don't see him again. And a couple of days later, I'm heading home from work. I just get into our elevator when a girl bursts in behind me. She's in her mid-twenties and looks kind of frazzled. I tuck my headphones out and ask, Hey, are you okay? Oh, yeah, I'm just... She stares at the entrance of our building until the doors to the elevator close. I'm getting a bad feeling. What's up with her? She looks scared out of her mind. I asked what floor she would like, and if she's okay again. And the girl shakily replies floor 7, my floor, and that she is fine. We get out together, and I realize that she is in fact my other neighbor. Trying to seem friendly, since she has clearly had some sort of horrible day, I say. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't introduce myself sooner. My name is Alice. I live right next door. She shakes my hand, having calmed down some now. I'm Amy. I smile. Well, have a good night, and tell your boyfriend I said hi, okay? My stomach twists, and I see what little color has been returned to Amy's face, drain away. I don't... I don't have a boyfriend. Trying to fish for some realistic explanation in my head, I press on with it. Your roommate, then. Sorry, I didn't mean to assume. Amy shakes her head. I live alone. Who told you that they were my boyfriend? I explained the meeting with the elevator guy a couple days prior. Amy, now looking sick, hurriedly explains the situation and insists I go file a police report with her then and there. This man, whose name I learn is Dan, has been stalking Amy for over three months. He's her ex-boyfriend and things ended very badly for them. She's been trying to get a restraining order since he's shown up at her work regularly. Been making phone calls, and now apparently he's figured out where she lives. I explain Dan's plans to do something special for Amy that weekend, to the police. We ask if there is any way someone could watch the complex for her that night. And this request goes nowhere, and a restraining order can't be taken up yet. And apparently, not enough evidence, and she has never been harmed by Dan. When we head back to the apartment. Amy thanks me and says she plans to spend the night and the rest of the week at a friend's house. Just in case Dan tries something now that we know he's in the building. Thankfully, nothing happened, and I never saw Dan again. But, Amy packed her things, 
and moved out the following week. So Dan the Stalker. Let's not meet again. So yesterday I was at my sister's house with my mom, watching my son and nephews play in the yard. One of my nephews, Harrison, was picking bark off a tree when I remembered an odd encounter I had as a kid. I said, so weird, out loud thinking about the encounter. My mom inquired what I was talking about, so I told her. When I was a kid, I was hanging out at the Pine Cone Forest, which was what the neighborhood kids called a small patch of trees on the side of the road. I was picking bark off one of the trees to pass the time, waiting for my friend Frankie to finish his homework and come out to play. Out of nowhere, it seemed, a guy came up to me. I could smell him before I saw him. He smelled like stale cigarette smoke. I was kind of scared when I looked at him. He wasn't very old, but he had a very lazy eye that was cloudy, and his teeth and fingernails were stained yellow. My mom taught me to be nice to people, even if they don't look like me, so I faked a smile and said hello. What are you doing? He asked me. The smell of his breath was the worst. Uh, I'm picking the bark off this tree. You shouldn't do that. It's like picking off the tree's skin. How would you feel if someone picked off your skin? He said while lightly pinching my arm with his sharp yellow nails. I, I don't know. I replied and took my arm back. Just then Frankie's mom called for me out the door and told me to come in and wait inside. I didn't think anything of the whole thing at the time. When I told my mom about it, she had this look of, I don't know, guilt maybe. She said that it's probably time I know the whole story. She thought I forgot about the whole encounter, so she never brought it up to me. First, you should know that the neighborhood I grew up in was a small, tight-knit community. Everyone knew everyone, and there was no reason for an outsider to come unless they knew someone there. Anyway, here's what happened with this guy. Frankie's mom, Sonia, noticed a white van with no windows parked on the side of the road. How cliche, right? She didn't recognize it, but figured maybe it was a visitor for a neighbor. Sonia said, or rather told the police, that the van had been there all morning and afternoon. She was kind of keeping an eye on it. She said she just had a bad feeling. Her house had a huge window in the front facing the pine cone forest, and the van was parked next to it. She saw me waiting for Frankie and kept a constant eye on the van while holding the phone just in case. She saw the man exit the back of the van and walk up to me. As soon as she saw him grab my arm and pinch me, she called the cops. That was when she called me into her house. The cops stopped the guy just outside of my neighborhood. In the back of his van were binoculars, a Polaroid camera, and pictures of me taped all over the walls and ceiling. Me at school, at my grandparents' house, at the bank with my mom. Just me, everywhere I went. But that's not all. He had a key to a storage unit on him. Inside the unit they found a cabinet full of knives. A lot of knives. Paring knives, a butcher cleaver, a thin flay knife, a melon baller, and just various knives of all shapes and sizes. There was also a few anatomy books, obstetrical equipment, duct tape, and ten empty five-gallon buckets. In the middle of the unit was an old bed that was used to restrain mental patients, so it had wrist and ankle straps, and the entire inside of the unit was covered in plastic wrap. My mom said he was in a high-security mental institution for the criminally insane, last she heard. So it's pretty clear, he 
had plans for me. So this is my first post here. I hope this is a good fit. I lurked and read a lot of creepy encounters here. So often people will mention how they give off a creeper vibe. It would be nice if they all did, because this guy didn't. So for background, this guy, we'll call him Pete, is the brother of one of my neighbors. I'm 34, he's around my age, and my daughter is 8 and plays with the neighbor's kids sometimes. Neighbors are relatively normal people. Yeah, they party a bit, but so do I. Pete seemed as normal as anyone. He didn't have the creeper vibe at all. No sweatpants and tank top with random stains. He didn't drive a creepy van, never made any inappropriate comments. In fact, he kept a neat goatee and was quite well dressed. And the few times I've met him, we drank and smoked together and he just seemed like an all around decent guy. And then one day, the cops are there. And they take Pete away in cuffs and he doesn't live there. But I guess they had a warrant and knew him to visit there, so that's where they got him. Now I figured it was probably no big deal. Maybe a drug charge or outstanding warrants for some petty stuff. Now I don't ask because it hardly seems polite to say, Hey, what did your brother get arrested for? But it's public record, and I know his name, so of course I checked. And the charge was about as bad as it could possibly be. Child rape. Victim under the age of 13. What in the actual fuck? He didn't seem like that type at all. And I guess that's what really creeps me out. Sick twisted pedophiles that could easily be mistaken for a normal person. As the father of a young girl, that scares me more than anything else. The creeper vibe just wasn't there. Anyway, he was convicted and will die in prison. So, seemingly normal super creep kitty diddler, let's never meet again. We won't, and more importantly, no other child will ever meet you again either. My husband and I live in an apartment complex in a kind of crappy neighborhood. Low income homes, what have you. There are always lots of break-ins, and it's right next to kind of the downtown area of my city. It was mid-April of last year, and I was about seven months pregnant, and my husband and I would often go out on our balcony late at night, really just the outdoor catwalks of the apartments, which connected to the outdoor stairwells and hallways. So it was either very late or very early, depending on your point of view, and it was quite dark and my husband and I were standing outside looking at the moon over the tops of the apartments. He was smoking, and I was unable to sleep due to back pain, the joys of pregnancy. We were chatting about whatever, and suddenly, in the dark before us from the first floor, we heard someone talking. It startled us both, and my husband cocked his head and made a shushing gesture as we both froze. A man's voice, low, was whispering something from the first floor directly below us. I had chills. I couldn't quite hear what he was saying, but it was only his voice, and he sounded like he was having a conversation with himself. As we stood there, both straining to hear him, his voice seemed to be moving away from us. Then we heard the distinct sound of someone shuffling up the stairs. He was climbing the steps to the second floor, slow and deliberately, still muttering. My husband instinctively moved toward me and put out his cigarette as the man rounded the corner onto the outside landing we stood on. He was maybe 35 or 40, but he looked aged in a way I can't really describe. His hair was prematurely gray. He looked really tired at first glance because of his body language, but his eyes were frantic. My husband later told me that he seemed to be high on meth. My husband wasn't a very good kid 15 years ago and had experience with certain drugs. He was also, unexpectedly, walking a dog, a very pretty blue healer. He walked right towards us and my husband stepped in front of me protectively. The dog stopped suddenly, and so did the man, 
as if he had somehow just noticed us. He visibly jumped, then laughed. Hello? <clears throat> oh gosh, I didn't even see you there. <laughs> Pardon me, just walking my little girl. He had the very definition of crazy eyes. They jumped all over the place, and when they landed on me, they jumped immediately to my big belly in an almost angry way. Oh! Oh! Pregnant! What? I said, sounding like a jerk even to myself. You're pregnant? Yeah? My wife, well, ex-wife, she used to be a doula. Used to do those things. Used to help out ladies and deliver them, yeah. Babies are great. I have two babies. Well, my wife has them. Well, ex-wife, I guess, yeah. It's hard to really convey how he was talking. He sounded really excited, but also weirdly desperate. You could tell maybe he wanted someone to talk to. Now I should mention that I'm a filthy bleeding heart and my husband is a take no shit, look out for number one kind of guy. He cuts the guy off mid ramble and says, We were just going inside man, you have a good night. Sure, sure, I'm sorry. I'm Mike by the way, I'm Mike, Mike. He sticks his hand out and I shake it. His hands are soaking wet. I almost immediately yank my hand back and he doesn't even notice. He's taking the dog leash and twisting it weirdly. Every muscle inside of my body is screaming for me to get away from this man. Instead, I tell him my name. At this point my husband grabs my arm and yanks me towards our apartment, past Mike and the pretty dog. I waddle to the door and as I open it, look back. Mike is watching me very intently. Once we get inside, we lock the door and talk about him. My husband is insisting he was on meth. He also mentions that it's weird that he's walking his dog, upstairs, at 3am, when we knew he didn't live in our building. I wrote the guy off as a creepy drug addict, brought our shotgun into the bedroom, and fell asleep. Three nights later we are outside again. The building across the street from us is another apartment building and moments after we walk outside, Mike comes out, staring right at us, walking his dog. He is smiling weird. He's headed for the stairs. We wave and go inside and lock the door again. Two days after that I'm getting out of my car at around 4pm and he appears, pretty much at my trunk. One second I was grabbing my stuff to get up and the next second he was standing there. There was no dog this time. He engages me in this weird conversation about how he knows my little girl is going to be beautiful, just like me, and how lucky I am, how I should never ever get divorced because it ruins people's lives. I can tell he is extremely depressed. He says his daughter and wife left him only a few months ago. My husband yells for me from the balcony and I make a lame excuse and leave Mike to his weird, jittery self. Husband interrogated me on what I said and warned me to just stay away from him. That night, there's a knock at my door. I check my phone, and it's 3.30 a.m. I have a lot of stupid neighbors that like to get wasted, so I decide to wait and see if they knock again. They do, this time more urgently. Feeling hot, fat, pregnant and tired, I poke my husband with my foot and tell him someone is at the door. He continues snoring loudly. I resigned myself to getting out of bed. I threw on a robe and trotted out to the front door. Just before I unlock it, I froze. Something told me to check my peephole. An unexplained feeling of dread washed over me. 
slowly, I peeked through. At first, I didn't even know what I was looking at. I squinted and tried to focus my vision. Something didn't look right. It didn't look like the hallway. I rubbed my eyes and looked again. The realization that I was staring directly into Mike's eye hit me, and I swear it felt like liquid ice in my veins. My stomach was in my feet, my breath caught, my hands immediately started pouring sweat. I jumped back from the door and started stumbling backwards. I backed into a wall and hit my head. I tried to catch my breath. Mike knocked again and called my name, softly, like he didn't want to wake anyone, like he knew I was there. He probably did. Looking into the opposite side of a people will show no clear images, but will show shadows. I turned around and ran into my bedroom, shut the door, and shook my husband awake. He sat bolt upright and grabbed his shotgun, told me to stay in bed. I heard him tell Mike to leave or he was going to call the police, and then silence. Within a minute, my husband came back into the room and said he was gone, that if I heard anything else to wake him up. I agreed and didn't sleep any more that night. Several weeks passed before we heard from him. In fact, we'd all but forgotten about him until our car got broken into. The cops showed up to collect evidence and we told them about Mike, about his creepy behavior and how we suspected him of doing it. They seemed confused until we mentioned his dog, and then the officer paled. He asked for a full description of what Mike had done. He wanted a statement. Mike got picked up two nights after the people incident for aggravated sexual assault on a pregnant woman in her own home, two buildings down from us. He had extremely bad PTSD from his time in the core and was also a meth abuser, just as the husband had predicted. So, I'm so glad that I checked that stupid peephole.